Hi, my name is Miriam Parkhill, and I'm the host for today's webinar. We still have a few people joining, but it's the top of the hour, so let's get started. I will be behind the scenes today, keeping things running smoothly. I'm the person behind the Plum Analytics name. So if you have any issues or logistical questions during the webinar, please press the green bar on the top of the screen, and then open a chat window and then send a chat to Plum Analytics. That's me. We will have time at the end of the webinar for questions. Since we have a large group today, you are all muted. But please use the same chat window I just described to ask questions of our presenters. I will gather these and ask them in the last 10 minutes or so of today's presentation. With that out of the way, I want to introduce Ed Clayton, Senior Director for Strategic Funding and Grants Administration at Autism Speaks, which is the world's leading autism science and technology, technology advocacy organization. He will speak first, followed by Andrew Mahalik, Plum Analytics President and Co-Founder. So I'm going to pass the presenting rights to Ed. And he will change, he will share his desktop and we will get started. Hope everybody can see everything okay. Marian, I'm sure you'll tell me if, if it's not working. Um, so uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, thanks to Andrea and, and Marianne for setting this up. Um, I'm Ed Clayton. I'm the Senior Director of Strategic Funding and Grants Administration at Autism Speaks. Um, I know a lot of people in the crowd are from uh, uh, the Health Research Alliance, which Autism Speaks is proud to be a member of. And, um, I'm really glad you guys can join us today. Um, this is a, an initiative that um, Andrea and I started together uh, a little bit over a year ago, um, and we're really almost at the finish line for, for going live uh, with the platform that we've developed together. And um, I mentioned at an HRE meeting, I think in March or April of, of 2014, and um, I'm excited for us to have a discussion about why we're doing what we're doing here at Autism Speaks with Plum, and then for Andrea to really uh, dig down and show you uh, everything that this platform is going to be able to do for us, and is already working for other organizations out there, um, but we are proud to be one of their first um, funding organizations that they're working with. Uh, Marianne kind of set this up already for me, and, and again, uh, folks from HRA have probably seen this slide about three times in the last six months. so. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, for the benefit of everyone else, again, we're the, the world's leading autism science and advocacy organization. Um, we're looking into funding research into causes, prevention, and treatment of autism, uh, as well as increasing awareness of autism spectrum disorders and advocating for the needs of individuals with autism and their families. Uh, autism Speaks has a number of uh, funding mechanisms. Uh, we are very proud of our uh, pre-doctoral and postdoctoral um, fellowship programs, uh, the Weatherstones and the Meissners. Uh, we also have a high impact, uh, kind of high risk, high impact program, the Suzanne and Bob Wright Trailblazer Award, named after our um, co-founders. Uh, we have a lot of targeted RFAs where um, the science staff identifies um, uh, a key question out in the autism research community and then we try to put a little bit of money behind it and request uh, applications around a very specific set of questions or specific set of topics uh, within autism research. And then we have staff and investigator initiated research projects, uh, much like uh, other, pro other programs, uh, where again the staff has identified a particular question or a particular need that we think that Autism Speaks can uh, help by uh, putting a little bit of money behind. And so we reach out to qualified investigators to kind of get that project moving um, to the benefit of our community. So a return on investment uh, is kind of what we're talking about here today, and that's something that I know that, that we at HRA have discussed uh, a number of times and will continue discussing a number of times because it's a big question. Um, it's a difficult question to answer. Um, and for Autism Speaks, we're really just trying to find a new way to, to look at this question and see what other options are out there. 
Um, up to this point in our history, probably much like uh, a lot of the organizations on the line, we've, we've used the traditional measures of return on investment, uh, looking at uh, the publications and patents that come out of uh, the projects we fund, uh, the dollars leveraged. You know, sometimes a $50,000 pilot grant from Autism Speaks turns into, you know, a $1.5 million grant at NIH. Uh, we think that's good. and. And we're happy to have uh, provided kind of the, the seed money for a project that really blossoms into something bigger. Um, we also track our fellows to make sure that they stay, you know, kind of in the autism research realm. Um, it's not really stalking them or anything, but we do uh, want to see if the people that we've funded, the people that we've kind of invested in as, as autism researchers are you know, kind of sticking with the field uh, and sticking with the people that, that have supported their research career up to that point. Uh, we also look at a number of things like the number of technicians we've supported, other graduate students in the lab of, of uh, some of the investigators that we've, we've funded, just to kind of get a little bit more of a picture of the, the economic impact of the funding uh, that we've provided. Um, and then probably like a lot of, of other people, we also look at the citations. Um, of publications um, uh, that have come from what we've funded. Um, that's taking you a little step for further. Not everyone does that. Um, it's something that we think gives a slightly better answer to what's the bigger picture beyond what we funded. You know, what's the next step beyond uh, the publication that was generated out of the grant that we funded. But that raises another interesting question. You know, when we're going out to walks, which is our big fundraising activity, um, and we're standing there and, you know, the parents and, and the donors come up to us to talk about uh, the science that uh, Autism Speaks is funded, and you kind of throw at them, well, you know, last year our funding generated, you know, 75 publications and two patents, and, you know, those publications have been cited, you know, 100 times in the last year. What does that really mean to them? You know, how, how are they going to go home to their family and, you know, their family member with autism and, you know, really kind of convey to them and to their friends and family and their other donors exactly what does that mean? You know, so our donation generated for publications from this one grant that we're kind of interested in, um, that really isn't providing a lot of meaningful information um, about a project or its results or even more importantly about how someone's donation um, is really contributing to, to autism research and ultimately to the treatment of autism for, for those who have it or for our understanding of autism for that matter. Um, and we're guilty of this. You know, I think probably uh, a lot of people are and maybe guilt's the wrong word, but we've done this. You know, we provide handouts and we kind of like make a little bar graph about, you know, how many publications have been generated, you know, since 2006. You know, we go to scientific conferences and, you know, we have a plenary session where we talk about all the great work we've done, and those same figures show up, you know, publications, dollars, leverage, citations. And again, you know, to someone with autism or, you know, to a family with autism, um, what does that really mean? Um, and we've discussed this at HRA meetings a number of times, and, you know, most of those discussions have left us wanting, um, to be quite honest. I mean, I think the best advice that, you know, I've heard at one of these meetings over the years is that, you know, as an organization, you have to highlight the winners and kind of ignore the losers and then just press on. Um, there's not much more that you can do about it. But I think that we all understand that, you know, we can't really do that. We can't really just, again, highlight the winners and, and move on. And at Autism Speaks, we definitely are left with the feeling that we've got to try something and publications, dollars leverage, citations, it's really not doing it. We, we've got to try something. And ultimately, you know, we've got a responsibility to, to our community, to our donors and our families to provide tangible evidence um, of the outcomes of the scientific research that their donations have supported. Um, we feel like we owe that to them. And, and again, we've got to try something. Now, how can you do that? How can you provide that tangible evidence? Um, that's actually not that hard. I mean, if you actually go to NIH and you go to NIH Reporter and look up a grant you might be interested in, there's a tab there that shows you exactly what publications um, have come out of 
of those grants. Um, it would be very easy for us. We have a grant search database to just kind of um, list the publications that came out of, out of the work that we've supported. The problem with that is that, again, you know, it will show you what the publication is, but it's really not providing you with a lot of context around the outcomes of funding grants. Uh, if you get two or three publications, you know, a lot of our community members aren't scientists, you know, most, like most community members. Um, they can look at a publication, maybe they can go into PubMed Central, they can actually take a look at that publication, read it for themselves, but again, are, are they really going to understand what they're talking about, what the, what the, uh, what the investigators are talking about? Um, so how can we provide more context? Now one thing that we do do um, here at Autism Speaks is that if a publication comes out that's been generated by some funding uh, from us, we'll highlight that publication, you know, maybe we'll do a, a brief interview with the PI or one of the key investigators, and we'll put that up on our website. But like everybody else, we do that, and then we kind of move on to the next thing. Um, sure, that, you know, highlight, that story is probably going to live on our website forever, um, but you're not going to find it when you log into Autism Speaks. You've really got to dig for it. You've really got to find it uh, to find something that you might be interested in, again, to get that, that broader context. And then maybe back to the original question, how can we as an organization, how can we as a science organization um, take the next step in evaluating our performance as a funding organization? You know, are we only going to rely on, you know, the traditional measurements? Are we only going to rely on, you know, those uh, stories that come by, you know, here or there where something we funded has made an immediate translational impact um, on the lives of people with autism? Um, these are big questions that we have not had a lot of answers to, which gets back to the, the, the broader idea of we've got to try something. Um, one of the things that we're trying and that we're hearing about today is Paul Madeleine. Now, Andrea's going to take you through a lot of the details, but um, one of the reasons that we wanted to, to partner with Plum Analytics on creating a platform uh, to kind of house uh, the output from our research, uh, our funded research, is that we really think it's going to answer, this platform is really going to answer the three questions above us. Um, this is going to provide a platform where our community can come in and view the output generated by our funded projects. And one of the key things here is that this is not just publications or like patent applications. Um, if one of our investigators goes out and is interviewed by the nightly news or has, a, has their own YouTube channel, uh, we're going to be able to pull in those videos and our community members are going to be able to view those. Um, if we blogged about it on our website, that's going to live on this platform. Um, if someone at Nature blogs about it on the Nature website, that can exist on this platform. If the local paper does, does a report on this, if the LA Times uh, does lay press on this, all of those objects can live on this platform, allowing for our community, com community members to come in and really see everything that's been generated by this project, not just the traditional um, publications that we're usually accustomed to looking at. So again, it's not only going to show what's produced, but it's going to show how this output was used, discussed. And what we mean by that is, so again, going back to publications and citations, you know, the publications are going to exist on this platform, and one of the things that Plum's going to be able to do is actually uh, count the number of citations uh, generated by that publication. However, Plum's also going to allow you to go in and look at what, and see what those citations were. Um, Plum's also going to be able to look at um, if someone gets interviewed by the CBS Nightly News, how many times was that shared by Facebook? Or how many times was that shared on Twitter? And how many people went in and looked at it? What were their comments on Facebook? What were their comments on Twitter uh, about that video or that publication or that blog post? Um, how many scientists have downloaded this new paper um, into their online database, kind of indicating uh, their approval or at least their interest in that publication? Uh, one of the fun things about this kind of platform is that a lot of times it takes months and months and months for us to know the real impact um, of a new publication. But one of the things that the Plum platform is going to provide us is that uh, we're going to have not real-time, but you know, very close to real-time data about 
how a new article is, is being used. If something's published in June of 2014 and then in August 2014, we already know it's been uh, received about 16 different kind of uh, lay press attention. If it's been talked about on Facebook 50 times, it's been tweeted about 75 times, it's been downloaded into an online uh, journal database 150 times, we know that we've got something that the community is paying attention to, and we think that that's valuable as well. Uh, for us as an organization, to kind of tell the stories that we want to tell about the research that we're funding. And that really is getting to the final point that I'm going to make before I turn it over to Andrea. This is going to provide us with a wealth of data uh, that we're going to be able to analyze on a lot of different levels um, in terms of not only the output of the work that we're supporting, but also how those outputs are being used uh, by, our community, by our community, by the other scientists in the autism research community, by scientists in the broader scientific community, uh, by the press. Um, we're going to get a lot of new information that we're hoping is going to allow us to tell uh, a deeper, a richer story uh, about the impact that our organization is having uh, on the autism research and general lay community. So Andrea, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you take them into some of the, some of the details. Andrea, is everything okay? Yeah, we're not hearing Andrea, right? Yeah, Andrea? I'm trying to reach her on the back end here, everyone. Andrea, can you hear us? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Great. Oh, you can hear me now. Oh, my goodness. Thank yes. goodness. <laughs> All right. I have no idea what was happening there. I apologize, everyone. So what I what I had just said, and I'll say again, is my name is Andrea Mahalik, and I am, as Marianne introduced me at the beginning, the co-founder and president of, of Plum Analytics. And my background is that I'm a technologist, so I've been building search products and information retrieval products since the mid-90s. And just prior to um, starting Plum Analytics, I was building a scholarly search engine called Summon that was in place at some of the largest research institutions across, across around the world. And my co-founder and I, who is a, his background is he's a librarian, and the two of us were working together on that scholarly search engine, and we saw there was a need where we could take the, the data exhaust that scholars were doing to have a new way of gathering data, gathering impact data, especially around what was happening. So we saw this opportunity to use this, this data surrounding the research process 
to really answer the questions and tell the stories about research, about the research you fund, about the research that people are performing, and looking at it from all these different aspects to, to tell us something new. So where did this idea really start from? Was all of the data that, that happens every single minute online. So this is a great graphic that talks about in 60 seconds what is produced. So you look at things like 72 hours of YouTube video is produced in a minute. There's, you know, the amount of tweets, the amount of just all this conversation that's happening. And some of this is around research. So researchers themselves have moved online. They share all of their data online. They, when they publish an article, like Ed was talking about measuring the, the outputs of the research you're funding, that gets published online. So you can count, you can actually count how many times has it been viewed, how many times has it been downloaded, how many times has someone clicked on a link to get there. So you can count all of those sorts of things, but there's a multitude of other sorts of things that we can count as well. So all of the, the social media activity that's happening around a particular article or a video about the, you know, the great work a researcher is doing or they're sharing that raw data behind their work, and other researchers are engaging with that data. All of these things can be mined and captured, and this isn't new, I should point out. So a lot of these, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Google, they've been around for a decade. They feel kind of new, but they're not. And the data has been there and been growing over that same amount of time. So if you were looking at research, the current state of how do you measure that, you know, the current state of scholarly measure is really on two different things. There, one is, well, how good was the journal that it was published in? And there's a metric called journal impact factor that attempts to give a rank to how good the container is. And that only gets you so far because there's great science that happens and not so great journals and, you know, not so great science that happens in good journals. So if you're really going down to an individual grantee and the research that they've produced, looking just at where did it get published tells just a small, small fraction of the story. And then you could say, well, how many times has other, you know, other peer-reviewed research cited this? How many times did it show up in the references section of a, of a paper? That can really be a good measure. You know, measuring citations is a great thing. However, there's a lag. The pace at which this peer-reviewed research gets published can take anywhere from three to five years, depending on discipline, to get to critical mass. Because it could, by the time, you know, someone reads a paper, talks about it, you know, saw it at a conference, talks about the research, does their own research, goes through the peer review cycle, and finally publishes, only to, you know, give you your first um, citation count, that can take a very long amount of time. This is looking at, at real data from one of our university customers. This is University of Pittsburgh. And this is a report that shows year over year how much output has been produced. That the output is the, you know, the, the line here on the top. So a relatively consistent amount of papers and videos and um, presentations produced year over year. And the red bars are citations. So the, that's counting how many cumulative citations did everything that they produce get over time. And the interesting thing to note is if you're trying to look in 2013 or 2014, that red bar, the amount of citations they've gotten are barely measurable. So if you were trying to say what happened in the past year and you only relied on this traditional way of looking at research, you really don't have much signal there. You don't have much you can measure. The other sor sorts of things that we capture at, at, at Plum help fill in the rest of that. We're, we're looking at social media. We're looking at how many times was it mentioned, how many people bookmark it, how many people are coming back and talking about this. Those are the other you know, the other colored bars, and they fill in that gap. They give insight where there was no data before. So the fundamental question we 
answer is being able to talk about what happened in the past year and not just the numbers of what happened in the last year, but the pointers to the stories of, of how people are talking about it, where they're talking about it, where in the world they're talking about it, and what are they saying. So we gathered all of this data that, you know, that data exhaust around research output and to make it able to be consumed and able to get insight out of it, we've organized that data into five separate categories. The first question, if you poll someone who produces research, you know, poll the researcher and say, what's the first question you want to know about whether your work had impact? Or if you're saying, what, what do you want to know about that? The very first thing they say is, well, did anyone read it? I created a video. Did anyone play it? So usage is that first category of metrics. That's where we've gathered together all the, the raw usage data at an article-by-article article basis of saying, did anyone in, interact with this? The next stage beyond someone just merely viewing it is going and, and what we've called captures. Now they're saving it for later. So they've hit the, you know, they've hit the bookmark this, um, button on it. They've marked it as a favorite. They've, if they're another researcher, they've put it in their reference management software. They're storing it. They're coming back. They want to capture it for later. And research has shown that this category of metrics are a great leading indicator of what will be cited later on. And it intuitively makes sense. If someone is you putting it, you know, researchers putting it in a reference management software, it's something they're going to, when they're writing a paper, go back and pull their references out of. It's where you go back to when you want to use it again. So this is a really important category and something that when you're looking to say what the, of this person's work, you know, of all the research we've funded in the past six months, what's getting traction? The, the, this is something that really shows that. The next category is mentions, and this is where you can discover those stories. So now people have gone beyond just clicking a button or saving it somewhere, and they've taken the time to write a comment about it, write a Wikipedia article that links to that, you know, that references that article, writing a, a blog or um, an, uh, reviewing it some way talking about that research output, and this is where you can drill in and look at what they're saying. Notice social media, the next category, we separate that. So social media shows in general how much buzz is around something, how well has it been promoted, how much are people talking about it. Many times if someone's doing something on Twitter, I'm not sure how many people on the phone are tweet, but if I tweet something, by the time I've moved my, you know, my finger off the, the touchpad and back to my keys to type something again, it's already been retweeted. And that's not because I say such fascinating things. It's because that's, that's the nature of the medium. It's just sharing things very, very quickly shows how well it gets out there, but doesn't it all come to um, at the same level as something like captures or even, frankly, usage is showing people have even read it. And then finally, as a part of our, our platform, we do capture the raw citations. Citations of articles to other articles, citations of patents referencing prior art, all of these things get measured and are clearly a part of the, the overall scope of what we're doing. So all of this comes down to that one, what we call an artifact, or you can think of it in simplistically as an article but we track many other things besides journal articles. So these article level metrics are at that, that atomic level, that, you know, the, an atom. What has this particular article seen across all five categories? So those usage, captures, mentions, social media, and citations. And each one of these, Often you can drill in the data behind it, depending on source, and we try that for every source we hu that's humanly possible to get the, the data behind the numbers. 
So in this case, if you look at usage, this is one article that we don't just collect usage in the one place, one place it was published, but across all the different places where we can gather that, that data exhaust from. So here we're showing it being, um, being published on an open access repository. Here it is in the publisher's website, the Public Library of Science. And then EBSCO, which is Plum's parent company, we have the ability to gather usage metrics from a, from a wide variety of, of libraries and universities and be able to pull that in to give another, another view. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So we gather from all these different places. And why that's important is you can kind of see down here in the, the Twitter metrics. So we're gathering tweets, not just from this, this um, 29 down here would be tweets just from where it was the official place it was published, but also other places online where people talk about it. We gather all of that data together in an easy to consume place and in a way that would be way too unwieldy for humans to try to track this down. The technology and the platform does that on our behalf. So I mentioned EBSCO. So EBSCO is one, you may or may not have yet even heard of EBSCO. It's one of the 200 largest private companies in the U.S., and they sell products, research and information products, mainly to universities, but also medical centers, et cetera. So 95% of universities globally have some EBSCO product. And what that means for Plum is we gather every single view, every click, every download from every publisher that's inside of these products, and we're able to relate that back to the research output. This allows us to look across where it was published, across how it got there, and give usage metrics to be able to compare like with like. That core, that core question of did anyone read it, we can now answer that question comparatively across most research output. That's something that's new. You know, it, Plum Analytics was a startup. We were acquired by EBSCO in January. This is something we felt so strongly about. We gathered that data, worked collaborat collaboratively with our new colleagues there, and within five months got all of that data for the first time into a product like Plum. And that sort of data asset has never existed before. So something we're very excited about. and turned out to be extremely useful from a pure measurement and analytics point of view as well. So I talked a lot about article, kind of simplifying our artifact word, but I just want to point out that we do measure beyond just a particular journal article. And depending on the type of research, different areas are very important. So measuring things like clinical trials, measuring conference papers, presentations, when someone gives a talk at a conference and then puts the resulting slides up in SlideShare, we want to be able to gather that. If someone's creating videos and putting them on YouTube or video, we want to be able to measure that as well. A quick example of what that looks like for something beyond just a journal article is a book. So this, one of the ways measuring the usage of a book is it's harder. There's not as many great digital traces online. So we do have uh, the ability here, the abstract views. This is the abstract view of the ebook version of the book, which is great. We also, to deal with the, those paper books that still exist, we measure the number of libraries who have that book in their collection. So that's the number of library holdings. And we give that, that information. We then look for links to books across Wikipedia, and we pull in from Amazon and Goodreads, how has this book been reviewed? So here's a case where the researcher would be able to look and see, you know, this is, you know, the best of its kind I've seen in 20 years. Being able to have that review and having the community see the research that was produced was well reviewed is something that's, that's valuable to give back, or even at times if it wasn't well reviewed. It's good insight as you're looking at the impact of what you're funding to, to have that. So in general, and I will jump out of PowerPoint mode here in a second, 
What we do is we categorize data into meaningful categories, we measure it, the platform measures it, and then provide analytics tools. So a little of what that looks like is here's an example of a, of a research article, and to Ed's point earlier, with a title that you may or may not know what is even being talked about here, but the metrics that we gather about this pull in, again, all five of those categories and give the data around where is it happening. And in this case, this plum print, which you see up here in the upper left-hand corner, which is a visualization of the article level impact across all five categories, was embedded into the place where this article could be found online. And when you click through, you get all of these metrics. Then if you were to click on the, the 33 tweets, what you see then is being able to drill into what people are saying about this article. So you can see here is the Reeve Foundation tweeting about, and, and what this article is about is for someone who's paralyzed from the neck down embedding um, a chip in their brain so they can move a robotic arm. It totally sounds like a, you know, an episode from a, a TV medical drama, but it's real research happening at the University of Pittsburgh. So what, what's great is from just looking at the conversation behind these tweets, you can see, you know, a foundation tweeting about it. You can also see, in this case, someone from Mexico talking about it in Spanish, not only linking back to the article, but also a YouTube video about this. And this conversation, this richness behind the, you know, somewhat, to a lay person at least, undecipherable research starts to paint that this is important, that these, these are the conversations that are happening. Going back to my, my search background and how online search engines look at research. So here is Google Scholar and typing in a search for autism in Google Scholar. The thing that you'll notice here, if you look at the publication date of the top articles in Google Scholar, and just like Google, most people do not go beyond the, the first page of results, what you see is with scholarly content, it's ranked by the number of times it's been cited. So this, the publication date, the most current thing on this entire page of results, the whole first page, is 2002. So if you do a search for autism, the researcher being shown back is a, more than a decade old, a dozen years old. And it's because they're ranking entirely by cited by count. So looking at the, the work that we're doing together with Autism Speaks, and this is one of their grantees, what I want to point out is the publication year here, 2013 and 2014. And then across all five categories of metrics, there's data. There's, there's things you can learn about this, about the research that had just been funded and just been published under in, in all cases. The only thing that's blank is the number of citations for a 2014 article, and that's to be expected. And so you can drill in and see what people are talking about. Let me hop out and show you it in action. So how we started with working together was something that probably most of you on the line have something somewhat similar to this, right? This is a set of, of grant data. So, you know, here is the, you know, grant ID, who applied, where are they, you know, what institution, where are they from, the type of proposal, the year it was published, and a little bit about, about the grant. This is the, the core data that we started with. Then Ed and his colleagues went through and looked per grant what was the publication output for each of these grants. With that as a starting point, we then, whoops, let's go to here, we then were able to structure the data. So the first thing is categorizing. We structured the data by those by broad categories. So in, in this case, the way that made sense 
to look at the Autism Speaks grant data was by geography, by institution, by portfolio, by proposal type, and then whether or not it was a major gift. These are configurable um, per customers. This isn't a, a hard and fast hierarchy, but it's an interesting way to look at the data. Then what we've done is then summarize, well, what were we able to gather about this data? Again, in those five categories of metrics of, you know, usage, captures, citations, social media, and mentions. So from, we were able to gather that across all of the data that was loaded in, and then what you can get out is, so if you look at the by portfolio view, and we have the raw data down here in a data table that you can export, but looking at some of the analytics behind here, we're able to see what is happening. So what I want to point out here is being able to look by portfolio. So looking at, you know, the core biology versus treatment and prevention, screening, risk factors, dissemination, being able to look across those and what patterns jump out. And so when Ed and I were first looking at this data together, he had said to me, oh, look at that. That's what we always expected. And when you look at your own data, you can make statements like that. When you're looking at someone else's data, I said, well, tell me more. <laughs> and he pointed out that in social media, the for the number of treatment and prevention, um, what's the gray bar here, for the number of artifacts, so the relative to the other proposal areas, when they fund treatment and prevention articles, it's getting a high percentage of social media attention. So that's important because if you look down here at citations, this is not work that's getting cited. And even if you look at the, the captures, which I talked earlier were the leading indicators, it's all the way down here, barely, barely measurable compared to the core research areas. So it's giving that new way to look at the data and, and find this is what we always believed and now we have data to kind of to back that up. I'll walk you through two other quick examples here. So looking at a particular researcher's work, I just want to drill in to the fact that you can look across all five of those categories do the obvious things like um, sort by different categories and um, and drill into what you want to see. So let me look at something that has higher usage. You again could see this plum print, all of the different scores and be able to drill in to the conversations that are happening around this. And being able to, you know, what were the key takeaways that people are having? What do they think is being talked about in the in the research? One of the other interesting things that we're talking about doing once all of the active grants are loaded in is making this data available and able to be discovered right from the the grant tracking application that Autism Speaks has developed. And so being able to take this data and embed it in other places. So being able to embed this visualization and link out to other things. So online, it's very simple, you know, two pieces of, of, of simple code to put in a website that then enabled this sort of interaction to happen. If I look at highly used content, so I'm going to look in this case at content, let me go all the way up to the top level here. And look at top used content. This was a article in, you know, in time.com. When I look at how people are interacting with it and, and clicking into the data, this is another example of the type of insight that you can get that shows, in this case, the, the geographic distribution, distribution of where people were in the world and they clicked on the link to the article. And so it's really interesting to see that 
you know, only 38% of the usage came from within the U.S. And looking across the other areas of the world, kind of lit up here around the globe, of where people are reading and gaining access to this data. Let me hop back in here. So I talked about the plum print, which is this visualization. It also enables you, enables you to scan a, a list of research and quickly skim and scan to find out where are the places that have impact. The integration can pull those metrics wherever you want, and not only at a article level, but at any of those groupings. So at a researcher level, at a grant level, at any of the, the, the groupings, like per proposal and, and showing that list of recently, you know, what were the recent artifacts that were produced and what impact did they have? And it drills you right back into those detailed metrics and being able to find the conversation. So we both create a PlumX website that ha is really a dashboard for all of this, but also pieces of content. So for your online presence, you can talk about what is happening and, and embed that data wherever you'd like. The core tenant here is we do not score any articles. We're not saying this article was a 12 and this one was a 92, but we allow the data to be compared in many different ways, especially if you're looking at it internally and trying to use it as Ed had talked about for finding the, you know, those hidden stories being able to sort the data. So bottom line is that there's this new way to tell the story behind the research. And as the competition for funding is increasing, so it's not new news, right, that there's the number of applicants are going up. So this, with funding dollars saying relatively equal or going down, the success rate is plummeting. So making that decision on who gets funded or how do you look at who's getting funded, these timely metrics, this being able to, you know, see what's happening in a comprehensive way, in a current way, is something that, that we believe is showing a lot of promise for telling the story in a very, very different way. And giving these measurement tools to enable really understanding the ROI behind what it is that you're, you're funding. So Marianne, at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions. And I'm hoping yes. that people navigated the chat window in the, in the top of their screen enough to type some into you. Right. So just as a reminder, if you hover over that green bar that says viewing Andrea Mahalik's desktop, it will open up a, uh, some options, and you can use the chat function to open, win open a window and send Plum Analytics the chat question. <clears throat> but people have been doing that, and we have some questions um, queued up so that we can get started with. So, you know, if you have questions, please type them in while we get started with some of the ones we have here. I have some questions for both of you. Um, we'll start with Great. you, Ed. Um, you talked about sharing impact with your donors, and I'm just wondering how are you going to share the information that's in the Plum Analytics um, dashboard with with your donors? So, Marion, I don't know how easy it is to like give me permission um, to show my uh, yeah. PowerPoint slide again, but I've got another slide that I can show people. Yeah, I will give you yeah. presenter right. Okay, and hopefully that comes back up. Uh, so Andrea mentioned this uh, very quick. Uh, I, I think you need to press the share your desktop or uh, um, right. button. All right, one second, guys. At least they can hear you, though, Ed. <laughs> Unlike me. Okay. How's that, Miriam? Perfect. Okay, uh, so the, the quick answer to that question, and Andrea alluded to it a little bit is that uh, we've developed in-house uh, a pretty nifty um, grant search site uh, where people can go in, uh, they can search by, you know, application type, by reviewers, 
by, uh, by applicants, by mentors, by keywords, whatever you want to search by, and get a listing of the grants that we funded. So what we're anticipating doing is that once the Plum platform is online, if somebody has a grant that they're interested in that we funded, they would go to that grant search website, they would find um, the grant that they're interested in, and as Andrew mentioned, there'll be a little uh, widget there. Maybe it won't look like a Plum, maybe it'll look like uh, something else, but they'll be able to click to that and actually navigate to the Plum platform uh, where they can look at all the output of that grant, they can look at all of the output from uh, the portfolio that that grant was a part of, that they can look at from that university, and really just navigate through there and, and get a really good sense of, of um, how our funding is paid off for our community. I think there'll probably also just be a straight link on our grant search page that takes them directly to the Plum platform if they want to start uh, navigating around directly within Plum uh, without looking for um, a grant abstract first, but that's the plan. Thanks, Ed. Um, I guess this is for you, Andrea. Um, are there other outputs that can be used, or is this completely publication-based? Oh, no, it's not just completely publication-based. It's really anything that has a digital trace, a digital footprint, footprint we can measure. So if it is, you know, a video series, or if it is um, a blog post, we can measure those sorts of things as well. Or a clinical trial, um, et cetera. Okay. And, and I think this, I'm going to throw this to either or both of you. Um, how are the publication outputs identified, and how often? So, uh, so I think Andrea, one of us may have mentioned the answer to part of that question. So uh, when we initiated our partnership with Plum, uh, my grants team basically went back through every application that we've, every grant we've ever funded, went through all of our progress reports and final reports, and pulled out the listing of all of the uh, publications um, that were generated by that award. Uh, they also included sometimes, you know, lay press and again patents and, and things like that. And all of that was added to uh, the uh, Excel sheet that I think Andrea showed to you, basically listing every grant, every you know key aspect of that grant, and then all of the output generated by that grant. Um, moving forward, the way that it's going to work once the platform's up and running, um, as one of our grantees informs us that a new publication is out or they got a little publicity uh, back in their hometown or something, you know they're required by their grant agreement to inform us of that. As they tell us about this information, we'll have the capability within my grants team to add that to their Plum profile and keep updating it as we move forward. And Andrea, if I was wrong about that, please. No, absolutely. Marianne, if you can pound, pass the bouncing yeah, ball back to me, there we it's go. It's coming to you. And I think you can do that for yourself, too. So. Oh, can I really? I didn't know I could just I, steal it from I, that. I think so. I think so. <laughs> so, what you, so, for some folks who may not have their publication output historically tracked, um, and for the example that Ed gave, so they want to add something more going forward, you can go in and there's a set of web-based tools to be able to claim all of that research. So being able to add, you know, any identifier, so for you know, published research, they often have these document object identifiers that you can claim or other scholarly IDs for a book, being able to an enter an ISBN. If someone has, say, a YouTube channel about their research, you can go in and add, if it's just a particular user ID for that, or you can come in and add things, you know, like by channel. And things like that will stay automatically updated whenever they publish something new. There's no new work if it's something nice and clean, but oftentimes it really is using the tools or if it's a, you know, a blog post, being able to just put in the link to it and it will be added to their metrics. So these web-based tools are a way to manage that. 
that whole process. Um, all right. <clears throat> Can Plum Analytics enable tracking of research slash researchers in a particular disease area that is not funded by a foundation? For example, this could help the foundation reach new researchers in the field. Yes, I mean, the, the short answer is the person who's buying the tool decides what data they want to put into it and what data is useful to them to analyze. So we have we have customers in all different types of disciplines from, you know, um, corporations looking at competitive intelligence to, you know, drug companies tracking the impact of particular drugs and conversations around particular disease areas. So it isn't it is not rigid, and that was something that's actually kind of a remarkable part of the story is that when Ed first heard about Plum Analytics, I was talking about it in a very different context, not at all around funders and funding research at all. And he looked, kind of tilted his head to the side and said, you know, I think what she's talking about can be used for this purpose. And that's, that's something that, that he saw and we're grateful he did see that. But it also makes it difficult sometimes to, for people when they're first seeing it to wrap their heads around exactly, you know, new new interesting ways to, to use the data and, and to use the metrics. So it's a blessing and a curse. Um, <clears throat> this is certainly a good way to get this type of information, but it doesn't answer the, the donor question of how the funding is moving treatments to the clinic that will help them and their family members? That's more of a statement than a question, but I guess we can turn it into a question. Do you, do you Ed or Andrea, see, see an application for this data um, in this idea of helping un understanding the movement of treatments to the clinic that will help the donors and their family members? So I think, first of all, I think that that's a completely fair statement. Um, but one of the things that I'm hoping is that, you know, some of the output from what we're doing is going to lead to a clinical trial, or it's going to lead to a clinical trial and that will ultimately uh, end up being a part of this, uh, this platform. Um, we know a lot of times that, you know, the work that we're funding, at least at the basic and translational level, isn't really going to pay off immediately, but we're hoping that, um, Eventually it will, but one of the things that we're hoping that the Plum Platform is going to do is actually give our community an opportunity to um, read about the output from, from something that we funded, but then get that broader context of where this is actually going to fit into that ultimate treatment. So if it's, you know, uh, an, animal, uh, an animal study, it's in a preclinical model of autism, but they're testing a new pharmaceutical uh, compound. Um, if that gets picked up and talked about, you know, in a nature blog and talk about exactly how that compound is going to impact, you know, clinical trial development, which will ultimately impact uh, the lives of people with autism, you're not going to get that story just by, oh, they published a paper, you know, in nature or just seeing that that, that grant produced a couple of citations. With the Plum Platform, hopefully you're going to be able to come in, look at the grant you're interested in, and read that entire story. You know, take a look at the application abstract. Take a look at the publication that came out of it. Take about take a look at the story that came out, kind of tying in how that project's going to fit into the broader scheme of things. That being said, you're absolutely right. It's not going to spell out for for um, our community exactly how this is uh, going to impact their lives, but um, we do think that they're going to get a story that that is going to be meaningful to them. Thanks, Ed. And we have one last question, and, um, and Ed, it's for you. Um, how will your grantees be able to use this platform? So one of the things that we're hoping to put uh, either on our grant search website or on the Plum site is a link that our grantees can email us and say, hey, I think you forgot this thing. Why don't you update uh, my Plum platform? Um, that's one of the things that we want because we want to make sure that the information on the Plum platform is accurate as possible. 
Um, the other way that we're going to, uh, this is going to benefit our grantees, um, and it's something that we've talked about, um, that I've talked about in past presentations with HRA and other organizations, is that ORCID, uh, your ORCID account can now be linked uh, to Plum. And so the idea is that um, all of our new um, applicants for Autism Speaks are required to get an ORCID account. So the idea is that our grantee goes out with their ORCID account, they publish a paper in Nature or Science, uh, they include their ORCID ID um, in that submission. Once it gets accepted, that's routed back to ORCID and then it's routed back into uh, our Plum platform where they can come in and, and take a look at how uh, their, their output is being used. Um, it's going to be open. The, the kind of data that Andrew was showing today is going to be you know, available to them as much as it is to uh, any of our donors or community members. So um, we think it's going to be a benefit to them as well. All right. Well, we are out of time, but thank you to Ed and Andrea, and thank you to all of you attendees for, um, for paying attention and, and asking interesting questions, and we hope everyone learned something. Thank you. Yep, thank you, everyone.